Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is uh, going to be a wonderful uh, show today. Jay Warner Wallace is going to join me in just a minute. Hour two is at least two Jews and a Gentile. We're going to talk about the traditions of Hanukkah and Christmas. That's what's ahead for you. I always look forward to having Jim on the show, uh, A, because he's a friend, and B, because I always learn so much from the way his brain works. So uh, he is... Uh, you can learn more about Jim at coldcasechristianity.com. He's got amazing credits. I won't read them right now, but trust me, they're good. Jim, welcome. Hey, thanks. I'm glad you're not reading credits. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make you sit through that. Yeah, good. Uh, That's yeah. very good. <laughs> All Are right. you ready for Christmas, uh, Bill? Are you ready for these I, conversations I, we're going to have yeah, in I'm Christmas get, time? I, I'm getting there. Uh, first of all, I want to cover a little bit of uh, cold case Christianity business. Um, okay. Christ Revealed being re-released, re-released today. Yeah, you know, uh, that's a documentary, it's a docu-series that we did, I think, six years ago. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because the company who does the docu-series does all kinds of interesting series that maybe I'm not that interested in. And so I was a bit, to be honest with you, uh, kind of a bit suspicious about what this was going to be. And But when I saw that, like, Greg Kokel, you know, Greg. Yeah, I know Greg. And Sean McDowell had signed on to do this, this uh, you know, they don't, they don't. They basically just say, hey, can we come to your house and interview you? And you have no idea what this is going to end up being. Well, it turned out really nice, and and I think it's very high quality. So, yeah, I'm glad to be a part of that, and it got re-released. So hopefully in time for Christmas, people will be able to find it online. It's just called Christ Revealed. A lot of us got interviewed from different angles. A lot of it's apologetics, which, you know, it's, it's you don't really usually see that in a documentary. Yeah, right. Especially, you know, there's something that gets done by people who I don't think the people who did this were Christians. They they, they might be, but yeah. they didn't seem like they were. And we had these discussions. And I thought, well, I'm not quite sure where do these folks land, but I thought it was a great opportunity. You, you, as a matter of fact, I kind of think that I want to do, I want to get the word out. I want to make the case for people who maybe aren't in the fold right now. And, and, and if they could be fair and they just simply report what we say, uh, it works out great. And I think it did in this case. Mm-hmm. And they can view that at no cost. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, and I, they have a really interesting, de- yeah, delivery model. I don't, it's like it's it's short. You have to do it within a certain number of days, or each episode expires. It's complicated, but you can go to the website, just to Google for Christ Revealed, and then you can figure out how to do it. Yeah, so for us, you know, we just felt like, hey, well, we're willing to do this if they will un and they, they they put us in without any edits. So those interviews that we all did came in on unedited, which I thought was just fabulous. So. Yeah. Now I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know you've written how many books, eight or nine? Uh, I think we're, we just finished number nine. Okay. Yep. And because we are a week away from Christmas and I know there's people looking for gift ideas, um, do you have a particular book that you think is a, makes for a, an easier gift to give to someone who's kicking the tires of Christianity? Oh, you're very kind to even ask that. Um, yeah, I think that the, 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 we wrote two books that are really on Jesus. Uh, the first one was 10 years ago, Cold Case Christianity. We have a new re-release of that. And then we wrote a book called Person of Interest two years ago. And I think that those two books together are are very easy read. I think they're going to be fascinating for people who maybe have never thought about how we work um, cold case investigations. And because there's a lot of tips in those books, a lot of tools that we use that we applied toward Jesus. And I think that they'll, they'll come away thinking, oh, wow, I never thought of Jesus that way. And I think that sometimes, you know, it's you think it's hard to share Jesus with people who don't know anything about Jesus, but sometimes it's harder to share Jesus with people who think they do know something about Jesus. So, and, and you have to kind of pop the bubble, you know, yep. that, that they, they think they understand. And they're just getting kind of these ideas from culture. They're getting these ideas and more and more the culture is not portraying Jesus in a fair way. So, so I think sometimes it's just good to, to help people rethink what the, what the case is and what actually happened in history. Yeah. I mean, helping religious people come to Christ is sometimes a harder um, exchange than speaking to an atheist. Yeah, that's true. And listen, that, that's not us uh, trying to be, you know, prideful and, no. and well, we, we have this and they don't. It's it's what Jesus said 
in the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about how you, a lot of you folks are out there doing things in my name, but I'm going to tell you, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. And if they're doing it in his name, that means you're calling yourself a Christ follower. You are, you're, you're identifying as a Christian and there's going to be a bunch of us. And I always worry, am I in that group? You know, I want to know, right. Um, in, you know, are, are you just claiming the name of Christ or are, are you somebody that's entering through that very narrow gate? And so, yeah, I think for a lot of us, we are in the, we would say we're in the club. Yeah. But to be honest, we we don't take the club very seriously. Do you think what appears to be self-righteousness is one of the things that annoys people the most when you're talking to them about God? Yeah, well, I think any more in a culture that doesn't believe that anything is objectively true, that everything's just a matter of an opinion. You're right. It's working for you, but it doesn't work for me. So please stop trying to push it on me because that just what works for you. It's like trying to push your favorite restaurant on me. It gets irritating after a <laughs> while, right? So, yeah. so I think that's that's what I don't want to hear anymore. Well, the, the, we're we so yes, if you're pro proclaiming Christianity as something that's true for everyone, then either you're in a culture right now that probably doesn't have a lot of patience for that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you should expect, right? So you have to, that's why you want to be able to make sure that you understand that this is not a, a suggestion about how to live a good life. Although I think that that humans flourish when they simply adopt the principles that Jesus laid out, but, but it really is a cure for what's killing us. And cures are by nature exclusive. You know, if this is the cure for this disease, then, then not, nothing else is going to work. That's why we're calling this thing the cure. Well, the same thing's happening here, you know, where we're saying this is not just a, a way to live, a way to vote, a way to think about politics and think about culture. This is a cure for the problem we call sin. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's another issue, right, in culture, right? Do we even believe that anything is a sin yeah. anymore? Mm. So I think that's part of the problem, right, is we have to be able to to, to have the number one to, to describe it for what it is, which is a cure. And number two, have the appropriate amount of passion that you would have if you knew someone was dying and you had the cure in your pocket. Right. You'd be pretty passionate and excited to share it. So yeah. that's, I think, the challenge. So Jim, when you hear, I'm glad that works for you, that doesn't work for me, that can be a, a freezing point for some people. How do you take it to the next sentence? Well, I always say, what do you mean by it works? Because it doesn't really work for me either. You know, if if what you mean is work, that I'm going to get raises and and promotions and be the most popular person on my in my class, um, you know that that doesn't that's not it's not going to make. And as a matter of fact, how would you like to adopt a worldview where the leader and initiator of the worldview predicts in advance that people will hate you <laughs> if you simply adopt his his teaching? Mm. Most people would say, well, then why would I bother? Right. And it's because there's something counterintuitive about this, right? There's that 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 if your God, whatever you think God is, agrees with everything that you're doing and agrees with everything that you think about morality, he's clearly not God. He's mm -hmm. just you dressed up as God. Because mm -hmm. if there's a God, you would think that his thinking would be so counterintuitive, would be so high, much higher than ours, that we would constantly find ourselves uh, being shocked by what is being taught and be at first in disagreement because we don't know. And, you know, otherwise, if, if you, everything that you think happens to be the, the position your God holds, he's not God. Yeah, good point. Jay Warner Wallace is my guest. You can learn more about Jim at coldcasechristianity.com. Do you feel, Jim, and maybe I should replace feel with think, do you think, because I don't like feelings as much as thinking, do you think right. that in the last five to ten years there is a, a pervasive hopelessness in our world? Yes, that, I think that, that has grown just, yeah. exponentially. Well, statistics show it. So, so there's it's hard to find a study on depression that doesn't mention as its key feature hopelessness, um, that as, an, as an, either a characteristic or a symptom. So, if you simply study the statistics on depression and the increase of depression, you're going to find out that that hopelessness is rising because that's sadly what's happening. And so, if you track that kind of thing. And I've been doing it for a while because it, that's part of the next book that we're getting ready to release. It's just, you know, on hopelessness, you'll, on it, what's one chapter of it? Um, you'll see that, yeah, this, that, that this is exactly the case, especially amongst young people. So if you look at like, like, like the global statistics, right, that, that we've been collecting for about 10 years now, according to the statistics, at least, mm -hmm. about 300 million people live with some form of depression or hopelessness that's in America. 
Yeah, it affects over 18 million adults who will oh. report their own level of depression or hopelessness in any given year. It's about one in 10 people are now, as a matter of fact, it's now considered the leading cause of disability. And and kids and teens are actually right in the bullseye of this. Like mm-hmm. They had one lengthy national study of kids like from three to 17 years of age. And here's what the researchers found. Over 2.7 million had experienced depression. And teen hopelessness is, oh. is still super high in the country. Uh, as a matter of fact, depression is the fastest rising uh, in, in this age group of teens. It's rising faster than any other age group. In one study, nearly 30% of boys and 60% of girls reported what they called, quote, persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, unquote. So we, we know what the statistics show that, that yeah, hopelessness. Now, what the question, of course, is why? Like, why are we feeling more hopeless now than ever before? And that that you can, I think you can attribute directly to social media. And this is what many of the studies are are showing. Um, at least, you know, a, a fair share of researchers will say, well, social media at least is a major contributor to this, right? So so this is, as a matter of fact, there are studies that show that they're, your, quote, negative emotional state, unquote, right? It, it actually increases the longer you use social media. And that's even if you're just like passively scrolling through your stuff, you're not even paying that much you just kind of scrolling through your Instagram or scrolling through a TikTok. The more time you spend online, the more convinced you become that that the world is pretty messed up, that it's pretty fallen, that that you know, people we we are increasingly polarized because of this. And it feels that hopelessness is rising. As, as a matter of fact, one study revealed that nearly 70% of us are aren't even optimistic anymore that anything's going to change or improve. Wow, so that's... I think that kind of hopelessness is is more common than it's ever been before, and that this is the environment, by the way, that we could share the the greatest source of hope if we are articulate enough to do it, because it turns out that, that that this cure for sin is also the cure for hopelessness. Yeah. Does it? I was talking to a colleague here, and he's a younger guy, and I said, "Do you find that in the last ten years or so that?" we've become more tone deaf to each other in our conversations. And he said, well, given my age, he said, I have no point of reference other than, yes, we're tone deaf all the time. And he sort of is native to the social media world. And, you know, he's, he's in his mid twenties and he is said, I don't remember a time when we weren't kind of tone deaf to each other. Wow. Think about that for a second. Just think about that. I know for a second, because at least those of us who are older uh, can see that, and that, by the way, that that should increase you and I as far as our hope, because we could say, well, no, we remember a time when it wasn't this bad. Yes. So that means that something has happened that's made it this bad, which means we could return to whatever was happening before, you know, or or we, since we know if we think, okay, social media is a huge contributor to this, we could at least change the way we're using social media. So like, for example, I'm on Instagram publicly, um, but I never post anything personal. It's just really for purposes of talking about Jesus. I mean, I may post pictures of my runs, but really uh, you won't find my family there. And then I have a separate account, which is just for my six kids. Uh, that's it. Mm-hmm. It's for my, it's just for our kids. And there's where I'm going to post all kinds of stuff that I think funny dad pun jokes, you know, whatever I'm going to post <laughs> or any pictures mm-hmm. of anybody, pictures of my granddaughter, whatever it may be, yeah. it's going to go on that account. And and that is because and it's just really restricted to my immediate family. No cousins, no aunts, nobody else is on that platform because I, I just know that I've got to curtail and draw back the, my use of. So I don't need to be seeing what all my friends are doing. I don't go on it for that purpose. I simply use it as a way, like a group text. Yeah. To commute. I could use WhatsApp, I guess, or use a group text. But this is just faster sometimes to upload, and you can put little funny words or little. Fun, and sometimes people will say funny things, and I only follow humor, just mm. humor, yeah, on social media. Why? Because then if there's a funny joke, I can share it with my family, right? And I only if, and you just find the place where there's clean humor. A lot of it is stupid dad puns, but that's what I'm going to do. And so, in other words, I've had to shape the way I'm using social media because I know the consequence of where it could go and how it contributes to hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Jay Werner Wallace is my guest. You can uh, find out everything you need to know about Jim at coldcasechristianity.com. He's written nine books. And if you're looking for a great gift idea for someone who 
is a little skeptical about Christianity, and maybe you've been in discussions with him. Uh, I promise one of Jim's books will be a rock solid. And The Person of Interest, Why Jesus Still Matters in a World that Rejects the Bible is an amazing book. And Cold Case Christianity I just had its uh, just had an updated uh, 10 year anniversary, I believe. So we're going to take a break and come right back. If you have a question or comment for Jim, let me know what it is. 877 933 24 84. Again, 877 933 24 84. Oh, there's so much sadness and desperation and loneliness, especially at Christmas time. It seems to me that there is almost like a big magnifying glass on the world, and we see problems just magnified, and we see people in their desperate situations almost worse than ever. But there is something we can do about it. And when we think of the story of Jesus, that is the story of hope. And if you have a story to tell, and you can give hope to someone this year— by sharing their story, we want you to do it. You can go do that at MyFaithRadio.com. I encourage you to do it. I'm back with Jay Warner Wallace today. And if you have a question or comment uh, about anything we've discussed to this point, if you just joined us, we're, we're talking about uh, some of the uh, conversations that we're having or not having. We want to get better at not only defending our faith, presenting it, dealing with ob- objections that people have and keeping the conversation going because we we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we always want to be defending our faith, making a case for our belief. And Jim, you're famous for encouraging people to um, be case makers. Give us a little synopsis of what you mean by that. Well, I mean, a lot of it is is we we believe. I just listen, I'm just listening to an interview, a town hall here in Los Angeles County, because we have this growing problem with um, like organized retail crime, all these flash mobs that come in, and my son has been assigned to a task force where he's investigating these. And you know, you're looking at this 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 interview that was being done, and you're, you're you, we were, it's easy to emote. Like, what are we experiencing in our community? What do we think is happening in the community? Then, of course, you got to support it with data because it may just be this is a perception about the level of crime in a community, but it's not supported by the data. And then, of course, the data could be, you know, manipulated a certain way. But the point is, you're far more likely to listen to somebody who says, well, here's the case for why I think this crime is increasing. Well, like, for example, if you if you wanted to know, are we more hopeless? Well, you want to hear my what's my case? Well, the case is studies and research has been done globally and nationally about the level of depression and hopelessness in the communities. So, so you want to know, is there a case to be made? Is this really happening or is it just my perception? Well, the same could be true, I think, for, for your religious beliefs. You think that the Christianity is true? Is it just because you want it to be true or you hope it's true or you've had a certain feeling? Or is there actually a case that could be made that it is true, not just for you, but for anyone who might be investigating it? So in a similar way, I think we ought to be able to make a case. If it's true, you should be able to make a case for it. And it should be something more than just your own experience because everyone makes a case for what they believe is true based on their experiences. Doesn't mean it's true. Mm-hmm. You can have a, you can have a false experience or, or your experience could be isolated and contextualized just what you're experiencing. We want to know, is this true for everyone? So I think that's why we, we want to be able to make a case for this. And in that, in that case, by the way, will probably include your experience, but it won't be limited to your experience. It'll also include the other data, which demonstrates this is true. Mm-hmm. Jim, do we still have the consensus or the moral consensus that uh, stealing is wrong? No, I don't think we do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean well, it's really we, sad. Because here, well, because here's why. Because we would say, look, even you and I would say, is, is it is every – so is there ever proper justification for misbehavior? But what, what otherwise would be seen as misbehavior? We know that there are sometimes proper justification. For example, um, if you in, here in California, if you um, are being attacked by somebody, you can use any level of force up to and including deadly force to stop the person from killing you. So although you might have to use deadly force, it would be properly justified because it would be in self-defense. Now, people take proper justifications 
and they manipulate them so that, that they could say, well, then everything could have a justification. So then that means nothing is really true. No, actually, it's just the opposite. Justifications demonstrate the fact that without a justification, this is immoral. Why would you need a justification? And then the question is, well, what objectively are the justifications that would get you off the hook? Mm -hmm. So I think in the end, all of these things point to you need an objective just justification or that killing is going to be considered a murder. And there's a difference between killing and murder. Mm -hmm. One is the properly justified killing is not murder. Yeah. And then you just have to argue them, well, what would be the proper justifications? So is stealing uh, uh, immoral? Of course. Now, I think that, you know, you, it's, you're, it's sometimes it's harder because stealing the word stealing already, like murder already suggests that there is no proper justification. Killing is different than murder because the word murder already contains the lack of justification. The word stealing already contains the lack of justification. Why we call it stealing? Like you just improperly justified. So I would argue that, no, that's something that is objectively wrong. Because stealing is the is taking something from somebody else doesn't belong to you without proper justification, right? Mm -hmm. The word includes the idea that there's not proper justification. So, so yeah. So now here we are in in, in looking at you know more philosophical conversations with your friends who may not feel it's so. Sometimes it's just easier to use an example that would affect them personally because everyone holds to a moral code. It, it may not be yours, but there's something that they would say injustice or racism, or there's something they would say could never be properly justified. This is an objectively immoral activity. Well, then you can ask the question, well, then what, how do you ground objectively moral or immoral activities? Like, is this just your opinion? So can I disagree with you and make it moral? Are you suggesting that there's a position, there's an activity that, that transcends both of us, that neither one of us should do it? Well, then where would that come from? Right. Like, where, where, where do you where do you get that kind of thing? If, it, if it's not coming from the mind of a human, so that if we disagree, it still would be immoral. Then whose mind is it coming from? What's the mind that it's coming from that transcends both of our minds? Mm -hmm. So I think in the end, you you really can't make any of these kinds of claims that there's not a transcendent mind from which these moral truths come. So Jim, you were in law enforcement for a long time and your son, uh, Jimmy, is in law enforcement and he's assigned to some of these uh, theft um, activity that's going on. Uh, what does father-son conversation sound like when you're talking about this? Well, I mean, a lot of it is like why, we're both asking this question, like why is this happening now at a level that's much higher than it's ever happened before? Okay. Is it a, is it a product of, of what's happening in California? But it doesn't seem like it is because it's happening all over the country. Is it is it a product of uh, changes in law? Maybe, but it seems like it's really what's happening is a decay in the overall moral consciousness of our of our our country. In other words, that 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 these kinds of things are not worth pursuing uh, criminally. Are we just going to allow this kind of be like people will watch these thefts occur in their own stores, and a lot of the time that they, they, they're what can you do? They just kind of like, oh, no one's going to ever... Even if I reported this, um, no one's going to do anything. There's a sense that no one cares, that even law enforcement may not care. Like the judicial, if you're in a county where the DA is not even going to file the case, you start to develop a certain amount of hopelessness. Yeah. Why would you care that, as in law enforcement if they're not going to do anything about it? Why would the why would the store owner like intervene? As a matter of fact, most store owners have already told their their employees, do not intervene. Because if if you if you try to intervene and stop this and he falls and breaks his knee, he's going to sue us and then he's going to win a huge lawsuit because you intervened. Just let him take it and we'll just write it off as a loss. And when you start to have that view of misbehavior, like, yeah, it's not even worth trying to correct. Well, the entire kind of fabric, the substructure of your culture starts to shift. You know, it used to be we had a chief years ago in the LAPD that that had this idea of a broken window syndrome. You know, if you don't fix all the broken windows and the graffiti in your town, eventually there's a perception that grows into a, a, a such a, a larger form of decay that bigger crimes start to emerge. Like sure. you need to take care of this. Like it's kind of like when when Jordan Peterson says you need to make your bet. You know, there's this idea that if you start by the simple things, it actually is the substructure of all the more the, the bigger things. I think that's probably true. 
And so it's happened, I think, in culture is that all of us, look, we're watching riots that no one seems to care about. We're watching them burn things down. No one's even stepping in to stop. Like what, if they're not going to address that, if they're not going to like, you know, we've got people who homelessness is growing and growing. No one seems to really care enough to find a solution. Uh, it's like it's a, we're at a point where there's such, I think, cultural hopelessness that that people don't even start to re- they stop reporting crimes. Now you can't even trust your crimes uh, reporting statistics because a lot of these crimes aren't even getting reported. Okay, if someone comes in my store and takes a TV, eh, just I mean, it only happened twice this month. I can afford it. You know, people actually stop reporting crimes because they feel like, what is the point? Hmm. Yeah, that is, it's pretty shocking. It feels like what parallel universe are we living in right now? Because when I see things like this on the news and I I go, I don't know how to process this. They're just racing into a store and taking what they want. Yeah. And a lot of this is like, what do we do? And this is, I'm sure, happening in your town as much as it's happening anywhere. It's in big towns. And a lot of it comes down to what is our, look, this is the hardest part of loving people. We talked about it before you and I, the idea that if you want to love like God, you have to measure equally truth and grace, mercy and justice. So to love people does not mean you do not hold to the justice as a matter of fact, sometimes the best way you can love a group, any group, including an entire community, is to make sure that you are measuring grace and truth equally. And and when we just say, well, you know, we don't want to incarcerate everybody because I get it. But but the, the, the threat of incarceration, you know, when you were a kid, if you knew that your dad was going to come home and punish you for doing that, you, that's sometimes what kept you from doing it. Amen. Because you knew that, that there was a bad outcome. For this kind of misbehavior now if you know that i can do these uh these crimes up and down the state and even if they catch me they're probably going to cite me out because there's no one's going to hold me for you know what they consider by the way it used to be petty theft when i first started working in law enforcement petty theft was anything under 400 dollars. you know what the, the height is now i mean you have to make thousands of dollars and before they consider it a felony so you can take a lot of stuff before anybody cares to, to qualify it as a felony. And even if it was a felony, if they're not prosecuting the felony, you can still get away with it. So what is the incentive? What is the fear of justice that's coming my way if I continue to do these crimes? And that's kind of the stuff we don't talk about. Um, it's But that's the foundational stuff that once that's gone, y- your culture changes. Yeah. Not only does it change, Jim, but I, I also see how people start to connect to this sense of hopelessness. Um, not Christ-filled people that have hope in their heart, uh, but societal, from a societal, societal standpoint, you start to think, oh, what's the point? I was talking to an executive over the weekend, and he was, I was saying, what, what's one of your biggest concerns? It's a huge, huge chain of stores. And he said, shrinkage. I said, well, what, what's shrinkage? And he said, well, it's the allowance made for reduction in the earnings of a business due to theft. That was like the number yeah. one concern. Yeah, well, this is what this is, it's, it, and it's been you know it's hard to, to find. It, it's so hard to measure this from a data perspective to see how bad is the problem really. It's hard to to get the data on this, but I think there's a perception at least as an employee, you, you know that there are some places that you're not going to shop because you have a sense that the risk is higher there than it would be other some other place. And this is probably why you see online shopping exploding, right? Why even go into a store where this might happen right in front of you? So I, I think that you you we all have this sense of and hopelessness changes things. Let me tell you, it's every worldview has a different uh, ability to address hopelessness, and ours actually is one of the highest abilities to address because a lot of this comes down to, you know, hopelessness is not just about well I'm afraid that our community is becoming more crime ridden. Hopelessness also hits you when you don't think that you've got a life beyond this or that that there is no eternity right it's fear it's fear of death um this fear of death thing has now become a, such a large area of study because it has such an, and there's actually studies out there that show that our fear of death actually causes us to be more and more polarized it's interesting i didn't expect to see that but it's true so a lot of the polarization we're seeing is, is that we are more and more becoming a more secular community, a more secular society, and the fear of death is growing. Uh, and the fear of death changes the way. There are some people who actually think that every decision you make is based on your least knowledge. Your, they call it mortality salience, this idea that you know that you're a finite human being has got a short life on earth, and this changes the kinds of decisions you make. 
if you don't think there's life beyond the grave, you make decisions differently, not just decisions about like, you know, what you're, I mean, all kinds of decisions you make differently. And I think this is why, uh, you know, figuring out your worldview is the first and most important decision any of us makes Mm -hmm. before we make any other decision, figuring out what view of the world is true. Because Christianity does the best job, I think, of reducing this death anxiety, they call it, or a mortality salience in the negative impact it has on us. Jim, this is called mortality salience? Well, there's a theory. It's called terror management theorists. And terror these are management? Sociologists. Yeah, okay. terror management theory. Oh and these are folks who are looking at our fear of death and our awareness of our own. Because we're as a species, we're unique this way, right? Like yeah. your dog has no idea that he, he's 14. Right. He just knows he's achier than he ever was, right? But we know when we hit in our seventies, hey, this is limited now. Yeah. I, I this is this is I'm I'm on the back nine, on the back three. I can see the clubhouse, you know. <laughs> it's like you know this is this is this is coming. Yeah. And that changes our perception of how we move and act and what we value and, and our relationships and our fear of death has so many negative uh, emotional and physical consequences. That that you know, it turns out that that religious worldviews or spiritual worldviews do address these issues, but some do it better than others. Mm. And I think Christianity does it better than anyone else. Couldn't agree more. Jay Warner Wallace is my guest. We're gonna take a little break and come back. If you have a question or comment for Jim, let me know. 877-933-2484. My guest today is Jay Warner Wallace. Don't make me brag about him because I will if you make me. You can learn more about him at coldcasechristianity.com. Again, coldcasechristianity.com. Jim, uh, did you take a uh, foreign language in high school? Uh, yeah. What'd you take? As, as, as I took Spanish because we're here in Southern California. Okay. But don't, don't, don't even ask me. Don't, <laughs> don't you dare test me. Well, I'm not going because, to. Because, yeah, good. I'm, I'm not going to order from a Mexican menu pretty good. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was just asking Wyatt during the break. He took sign language and he said, oh. well, don't ask me to do anything. And, and I thought, well, here's the, here's the problem with if we don't get out and practice uh, sharing our mm. faith, uh, you know, giving evidential uh, reasons and well-reasoned re- um, explanations for what we believe, we're just not going to be good at it. Yeah, it's a muscle. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a muscle. muscle memory. Yeah. yeah, it is muscle memory. Yeah, it is true. And but to be honest, you know, it, so that sounds like okay. So what you guys need to do is you all need to go out there and really force yourself to to do. Well, I guess that's true. But the easier thing is well, just. Just how about this? If you just love it appropriately at the level that you should love it, um, that's going to change your engagement of it anyway. I mean, it's not like we have to say, so the things that you already geeked out about and you share with your friends, it's not like we need to t- encourage you to do more of that. That's happening anyway, because these are the things you're geeked out about. I always go back to sports, right? Because yep. there's deaths from, you know, I, my sons and I are both in a fantasy football league and they're doing a lot better than I am this year. And now this week is playoffs, right? So they're in the playoffs and, and I'm just in what they call the toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> which is the bowl for all the losers, okay, in this playoff, right? So, but you know, we're we. It's not like we. You have to say, well, well, you guys need to study the rosters and study. Now, that's happening organically because they're interested in doing well in this league. So it turns out that a lot of what we why we're not good at something is not because well we haven't like exercised this muscle. We're not forcing ourselves to go out and do this. It's because we we don't have an appropriate um, reverence. Or like we're not geeked out enough on it. Right. We're not. It's like it's not the thing that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and and so that's where you know you can make this. You know, like we're older now, Susie and I, so we have some margin where we can do devotionals and be really much more structured about our time in the Word or listening to sermons or all that stuff. And that that so it does help if you've got two of you in the relationship who can encourage each other to, to make this your priority. You mm-hmm. know, I was, we, we, last night we were 
uh, we had a long day with our granddaughter and at the end of the night, you know, we're like, we have options. We have some discretionary time. I probably would have just zoned out. I would be more than willing to watch an hour of pretty much anything that would just be, you know, <laughs> relaxing. And so she's like, no, she wants to listen to a sermon. Oh, wow. So, so we end up listening to a sermon and taking notes. Now, for me, that's the kind of thing that, that it's good to have somebody who is, even though we're both geeked out on it, there's just some days when you just need somebody to encourage you. So, so be that for your spouse, be that for the, for your kids, be that, you know, just, and also, you know, just be geeked out on it and you won't have to worry about, well, am I practicing enough? You never worry about whether you're practicing enough when it comes to your hobbies. You get most of the time you're thinking, am I doing this too much? Right. You know, right. Do I need to cut back on this, you know? Well, this is, if you're geeked out on this, you'll be feeling the same way. Yeah. Jim, what do you think is one of the more hijacked words nowadays in Christianity? Well, right now, I think it has anything to do with justice. And so I think those are the, the words that we're most confused about because yeah. these are the areas where the culture is really engaged. And um, and, if, and because we, of course, do believe, we do know that God is just, and this is, a, this is his nature. This is an area of overlap. We have concerns too, but but how we might exercise those concerns is going to be different based on, on number one, we, we have to ground everything in the word of God. And I do worry that what's happening is we've kind of, a lot of Christians are are thinking that word of God is pretty malleable and maybe needs to be context updated. And, and maybe, you know, the things that what Paul was writing about were locked in the first century, don't apply to us today. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a lot happening right now in the way that people are reading scripture. Mm -hmm. but, but in the end, mm -hmm. our definitions have to come from scripture. Yeah. I saw a debate on the internet a couple of days ago where two sides were very opposed, yet they were both using the same approach, the same scripture, the same kind of uh, uh, Christian uh, vernacular. And all of a sudden you think you're both using the same words and defending your positions. And one was clearly wrong. Well, and a lot of this too is like, look, you know this, um, that, that, but most of the time you can make it a case for anything. If you're willing to just excise one verse, right. To do it, you can make a case for anything, P positive and negative. Um, so you can do that. You people always used to say that skeptics would say, "Well, look, slavery were, was, was conducted by people who were Bible believers." I, I get it. You can make a case for any misbehavior if you're willing to just cherry pick. If you don't know the breadth of Scripture, like if you if you caught me saying something and you didn't know me very well, and you only were in my presence fifteen minutes. And all you had to go on were my statements in those 15 minutes. You would not know the heart of where I, where I really stand on issues, as well as maybe my kids who have seen me for years or my wife who has seen me for even longer. So it turns out it's most of the time people can make a case for anything because they're not really in the word. They're, they're not looking at this verse. You know, if you've got, I always say, if you've got 20 verses on a topic, you have to evaluate any one of those in, in the context of the other 19. You cannot take anything in isolation. So, so the question, like a cumulative case, you know, some of these cumulative pieces of evidence that point to my suspect could be interpreted a number of different ways. But when you see I've got twenty pieces, what are the odds that those twenty pieces have to be interpreted in, in against you know the case rather than for it? Uh, it's it's that the other nineteen pieces help you to figure out. Well, if this one's on the fence. And it could be interpreted either way. Well, now I know which way to interpret it because the other 19 are not on the fence. And they pull me in that direction because those are not fence setting uh, verses. And I, I see all the time issues of justice, issues of, of even sanctity of life, all kinds of things that are, are just isolated cherry picking of verses without looking at the, the entire context. You know, how do we, for example, how do we assess the, the sin of the, of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah? I've heard people say, well, it's the sin of inhospitality. Well, you'd have to really ignore all of the New Testament passages that talk about Sodom and Gomorrah to come to any kind of a conclusion other than what it is that we know that the Sodomites were doing. This is just the, 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 the fact of it, right? You'd have to take the verses in isolation in order to make a case. For something other than what's clear, once you get all, so uh, first thing you got to do is say, okay, well, where where in Scripture is this issue addressed? I mean, I need to know everywhere in Scripture where this issue is. Now I can make a case. Mm -hmm. The same is true, like, by the way, in discovery, right? Like, if I have 100 pieces of evidence pointing to this bad guy, 
Well, the def- defense wants to know, were there really 112? Are you leaving 12 out? <laughs> maybe that's maybe you're prejudicing my my client because you left out 12 pieces. Yeah. So show me all the discovery. So we have to be able to show that, yeah, we're, here's everything. And now with everything considered, here's the most reasonable inference. And the same thing is true here. Mm-hmm. I, I love that strategy. The, you, you have to present all the evidence and then you make uh, the inference from all the evidence. Right. And you'll see that a defense tactic is always the same. Well, this one piece, piece 97, that 97 is a weak piece. That points, okay, I get it. 97 is weak. I get it. But we've got 112 pieces. And, and if you're wondering how to evaluate 97, well, you can look at all the other 112 pieces and see, well, where do they point? Right. You're, you're going to argue there's a coincidence that 112 pieces just errantly make him look guilty? <laughs> I mean, it's possible, <laughs> yeah. but it's not reasonable. And that's what we're trying to do with scripture too, right? We, we've got a piece that you think is, I felt like I'm not sure how to interpret this. Yeah. We'll find every verse that deals with that issue and see how to interpret those. So many of those would be very clear. And now you know how to interpret this one that's not as clear. Yeah. We'll take a break. Jay Warner Wallace is my guest. Go to coldcasechristianity.com to learn more about Jim. We'll be right back. Faith Radio and Afternoons with Bill podcasts are available because of listener support. If you are a supporter, thank you so much. Becoming a supporter today by visiting MyFaithRadio.com. Welcome to the show. If you just joined, Jay Warner Wallace is my guest. His uh, website is ColdCaseChristianity.com. I highly recommend you go there. There's all kinds of books, writings, videos, podcasts, and free material as well. So I, I highly recommend you check it out. Jim, one of the many things I like about you is you have thought through just about everything. And if you haven't thought through it, you're willing to think through it. But if someone were to ask you, Jim, what, why, why are you a Christian? I know you'd have an answer. Yeah. It's, unfortunately though, it's, it's not an answer you can do on social media because it's a long answer. But I, <laughs> I just got, I'm a Christian because it's true, but how do you know it's true? Um, and that's really, I mean, I, I had a really rather unemotional entry point, right? I didn't have a crisis um, I just um, was provoked to to study it, to, to look at the claims of the gospel authors and determine if the, actually, the resurrection actually occurred. And so for me, it was really about assessing the um, gospel authors as eyewitness accounts. And a lot of people are, are that find that to be quite controversial. I didn't see it that way. I mean, I knew that Luke was not an eyewitness. He tells you he's not an eyewitness, but he tells you he's talking to the people who saw Jesus personally. So I have to assess what he makes, the claims he makes. Like, like you would any series of claims about an event in the past, whether that event is 20 years ago or 2000 years ago. I mean, it, it, it yes, it matters the distance uh, in the past you're investigating something, but if you're investigating a claim in which your living eyewitnesses are no longer alive, and that is often the case in cold cases, it doesn't really matter if it's a hundred years ago, or if, if you don't have access to those people who saw it, it's it's why these cases go cold, mm-hmm. but they are. You can still figure out what happened. And by the way, this is true for every historical case. There's about nothing in the history of our country, unless it happened in our generation, that you could have a living eyewitness tell you something about it. You don't. You you don't have. You don't. You you can't trust living eyewitnesses for what happened in World War One. Yet we think we know a lot about what happened in World War One. So the standard has to be something you can evaluate. And determine if it's if it's reliable, and so that's what I tried to do with the Gospels. And I use the same process that I would use on any investigative case, but that it does particularly show up in cold cases because they are so old. So, so that's really how I got in. Now, look, I've already used up way more words than I could do on a Twitter post, of course, or an Instagram. So that's why it, this is not the kind of thing. This is why, if this is all you're talking about. And and sometimes, you know, having an answer to everyone's question is helpful because that keeps the conversation going because they peel off questions. And although they may not allow you an hour to present your affirmative case for Christianity, they will sit with you for an hour if you're simply answering their questions. So because it's them, it's generated by them, not by you. So a lot of this is, you know, one of the best ways to share the gospel is simply to be able to answer people's objections. Because they, they probably will tune you out if you're just going to go on and pontificate for an hour about the gospel. But if they're like, yeah, but what about this? Well, they'll give you the bandwidth usually to answer it. Mm-hmm. And that there's an opportunity for you there. 
to present the gospel in that. Like we were talking about why do we think that Christianity is the one view? Well, it is the most successful view because we talked, I think you know, I talked about this before, because there's idea of this persistent self is that worldviews that offer a persistent self beyond the grave reduce hopelessness and depression and death anxiety. So although, you know, some Near Eastern views like reincarnation, it offers a, a view of the self that, that that spans the grave, but it's not you. It's a reincarnated version. So it's not the persistent you. It's just a different version of you. If you're an atheist, there's no version of you that, that spans the grave. If, if you're somebody who believes, you know, th so this is a view we hold as Christians that the persistent you will persist. Your soul, you're a soulish creature. And although your body may die, you, the real you, the soulish you, will persist beyond the grave. This is different than, and by the way, this is also a view that says you can't earn that. So hopelessness often comes from your ability, inability to earn it, your inability to achieve it, or it comes from pride where you think you have achieved it. This is a view that starts and ends with humility and offers a soulish view of you that persists beyond the grave. It has the ability to, to provide, because humility is the solution for everything, uh, because pride is the problem for everything. So, so it actually is, the, is a, a worldview that offers a, a cure for hopelessness, and it offers a disposition, humility, which will improve your quality of life in ways that no one can even imagine. Mm -hmm. Jim, do you think, uh, why are you a Christian? Do you think that's a hard question for people to answer? Well, I don't think it is uh, because a lot of times people will say, well, here's what happened to me. They'll just share their testimony. And I, listen, I get that, that in some ways, yeah, it's very powerful. I'm not going to, that that would not have helped me. I never, I thought everyone's got a testimony. And I had so many Mormons in my family and they had testimonies and I didn't believe Mormonism was true. So I just didn't, I was skeptical of any sure. kind of testimony. But for a lot of people, if that's where you start and stop, that is for a lot of people, that is huge. That we we you know you you if, if you have a problem and somebody tells well let me tell you how I solved it, you're inclined to listen to their story. Yeah. So it's, it's not just religious testimony that is powerful. It's any kind of testimony. We watch videos on YouTube. Show me how you fix that. Yeah. They did it this way. I'll do it that way too. So it's just it's just the nature of who we are as humans, learning from each other. But 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 for me as a skeptic, I just was not interested in anyone's testimony. So you needed to show me. Well, yeah, but why is it, why is it you are interpreting that as an act of God when it could just be your psychosomatic response? It could be any number of things. You know, you're cured because you had great medical treatment. I don't. They misdiagnosed you. Who knows what it is? But why would you think that's from God? So first, make your case for God, and then you can tell me how your experience reflects that God. Mm -hmm. But 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 I think if all you did at at this holiday season coming up was to share what happened to you, that may be powerful enough, at least for somebody to take a first step. And so well, then tell me a little bit more. But boy, better be ready to be able to offer why this is actually true and not just your experience of it. Mm -hmm. And to remain humble. And if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. But would you be willing to, to, to journey with me as I try to find it for you? That, that's a good question. That's like, a great if you don't have an answer, you just don't leave it there. No, no. Yeah, well, maybe I'll see you next year. No, how about this? <laughs> Would you be willing to, to to hang out with me? Just let me stay with me long enough so we can figure that out together. Because if you're really serious about that question, let's let's do it, let's look at it together. And then you can go on that journey together. Don't be afraid of any question, because if this is true, it'll hold up to any question. And if you believe it's true, it's not like you have to make stuff up. It's just you got to figure out how do I answer that question. Mm -hmm. And you could do that, but just don't let them off the hook. I mean, don't, don't just release it. You know, maybe I'll get back to them. Let, let, like, let's, let's do that. I mean, sometimes you can start with the question or like right now, you know, you have immediate resources available. There's so many phone apps for a Christian apologetics. So many, we have one too. I mean, there's so many things out there. You could just go on and, and, and take a break, you know, go outside with <laughs> Google it real quick, come back inside. <laughs> well, here's one way to look at it. Yeah, good you point. Know, there's so many options you have, Just, but just don't say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer that either. That's a good place to start, but but follow it up with, well, how about if we find out the answer together? Yeah, that's probably the best the best approach to take. And if, if they're sincere, uh, they probably will go along with you. Yeah, I think that, well, that's just the question. Sometimes people offer an objection. They really don't want the answer. They don't. They just want to stop you from talking. <laughs> so that's why jury assessment is so important. Is this somebody who really 
is seeking? Is it somebody who's really open or is it just somebody who wants to shut you up? And yeah. you know that in your own family, you know that who the people are, who really you're better off talking about something else. Yeah. But you know, for those people, you're going to pray and then you're going to model Christ for yeah. those people. Yeah. Jim, thank you so much. Always great to have you on. And I look forward to our next conversation. Hey, Merry Christmas. Merry to Christmas you, to you. Jay Warner Wallace has been my guest. Cold case Christianity. Dot com is the website you can learn more about Jim and his books and all that he's got going on is right over at coldcasechristianity.com. After a short break, we've got at least two Jews and a Gentile. We're going to talk about Hanukkah and Christmas. That's next. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.